Welcome back, everyone, to Two Nobodies. Today we have a very, very special guest. I've been thinking about this guest since, Kyle, since we started the podcast. This is somebody that I had identified and was just waiting the for the right... Top of the list. Was waiting, <laughs> was waiting for the right opportunity um, to, to, to welcome Dr. Emmett Allen Verko. We're so happy to have you this morning. Thank you for making yourself available on a Saturday morning. Uh, that is really appreciated. And for those who don't know of Dr. Ver- Alan Verko, she is the speaker for the microbes. She's the person <laughs> who, you know, uh, if you've heard about the robo gut, she has that in her lab. But anything microbiome, um, I feel like we're just going to have an incredible conversation with her. So welcome to Two Nobodies, uh, Emma. We really appreciate having you today. Thank you very much for having me. I really hope that I can be awake and alive enough on the Saturday morning <laughs> to answer your questions in a, in a salient way. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're, we're, we have a list of questions, but we wanted to first kind of just start about the beginning. And Kyle, yeah. I think you wanted, to, you wanted to ask a little bit about our roots, hey? Yeah, so you started your career in the UK, sounds like, and then transitioned yes. over to Canada. And I'm going to ask you a question that has nothing to do about um, anything gut related, but, uh, what do you miss most about the transition? I've spent a very minimal time over there and, um, I've had Cornish pasties and I love it. And I had a wonderful English <laughs> breakfast, which I love. And I'm wondering if you miss any of those kinds of things from home. Is there one thing that you really, really miss that you just can't get a good analog over here? Um, you know, there was because we came over in, uh, 2001, um, and at that time, you know, the internet was kind of, it was there. It was obviously usable, but um, we couldn't stream things. Uh, what I really missed was BBC. And that sounds really trite, but, uh, but now we can just stream that all the time. So I listen to BBC radio, I watch TV, BBC TV. Uh, and, uh, and so it really, honestly, there's nothing that I miss, apart from my family, obviously, because we are the, yeah. only, the only ones over here. So uh, the rest of my family is, uh, is back in the UK, and I miss them terribly. But, okay. um, but you know, my, my uh, kids are getting older now, and my uh, eldest daughter actually has gone back to, uh, to Europe. She now works in France. So it's, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, it's kind of sad that she decided to leave Canada to go back, but I guess she uh, used her citizenship and, uh, uh, and went back. Yeah. Anything that you found in Canada that uh, now you're not so sure you could do without if you ever moved back to the UK? Yeah, definitely. I don't think I could live without the sense of community that I have in Canada. I, and mm. I think um, I, I find that very hard to say because that makes it sound like we don't have that in the UK. We do. Uh, but I think in, uh, in Canada, certainly in Guelph, where, it, where we are now, the, the, the feeling of community spirit is far higher than I've ever experienced before. And, mm. uh, you know, even in Calgary before that um, also. And, uh, and I just think it's a sort of a different feeling just because people are sort of a bit more aware of other people in Canada than, than uh, perhaps in the UK. Uh, and maybe that's changed, or maybe it's just something that I experienced at the age that I was. Uh, but uh, And I don't think I would have advanced my career as well uh, in the UK as I did here. There's many more opportunities, I think, uh, which I took advantage of. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so I actually became a Canadian citizen in 2008, and uh, it was quite hilarious, actually. We had to uh, pledge allegiance to the Queen, which, uh, which was quite funny. <laughs> I've never actually had to do that as a Brit, um, and uh, but uh, but I did actually feel like um, you know that that was the right thing to do. And by that point, we'd uh, uh, you know we'd had a, a, a child who was born in Canada, so uh, hmm. she sort of identifies uh, much more as a Canadian than she does as a Brit. You know, in Guelph, right? Yes, yes. That's a. Guelph. I mean, I, so I'm from Ontario. I study at the University of Waterloo. Very familiar with that area. Yes. Guelph's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, this time of year especially, with all yes. the leaves turning, it's, it's beautiful. Although today it's a bit rainy and awful outside, but, uh, you know, we can't have everything. Do you know, on, uh, on Thanksgiving Day here, it was 
uh, 25 degrees and uh, we hadn't actually closed. We have a little backyard pool and uh, we hadn't closed it because we sort of anticipated a little bit more warm weather. Mm. Um, and so we were actually swimming in the pool on Thanksgiving Day, which was like, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't imagine doing that. It was, it, so that must be climate change. I don't know, but, uh, but it, we benefited from it this year. Emma, I don't know if you know where we are at right now. We're in Edmonton. So yes, I yes, thought so. Yes. We, don't, we don't get this. Kind of, this is the big difference, I find, ever since moving to Alberta, is the shoulder seasons are so much shorter mm-hmm. and not as welcoming. Although, Kyle, we've had a pretty good fall, hey? Like, it's been... I love fall, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've only really spent most of my time... Uh, I moved to Alberta when I was eight years old, and so that's really what I know best. But I love fall, but it's absolutely... It's like you, you, uh, there can be years where you're lucky and you'll get a month of fall, you know, six weeks, maybe. Um, at the very outside, two months, but yeah, yeah, it's usually, it can be as low as two weeks or something like that. And, and then the snow just hits and then it's mushy. And, yes. Get that um, strong wind and then the leaves are gone the next day. It's, it's, yes. it's, just, it's just brutal. But, yeah. Uh, well, I, we lived in Calgary for a few years and uh, oh, yeah. loved Calgary. It was a beautiful place, but uh, the weather really, you know, that's the one thing as a, as a Brit coming over to Canada, everyone tells you that the weather is just so terrible in Canada. It's not true. Mm. I think it's a little bit more extreme. But actually, uh, we benefit from beautiful summers here and uh, mm-hmm. a little bit of cold. But the uh, the winter in Calgary was a little bit extreme for my liking. <laughs> I, was just like, <laughs> I can't imagine in Edmonton. I'm sure it's worse. <laughs> oh, it's about the same. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you know, those deep winter months, that, that, that January, February, where it's, you know, the couple days of minus 40 Celsius that, um, yeah. that can get to you, you know. Certainly. Definitely. Emma, from a, from a, a personal side, my interest comes, you know, I, I think I'm going to mention my wife's a naturopathic doctor. So we talk about like, you know, gut flora and poop and all kinds of stuff <laughs> all the time. Uh, so there's that. But my but the, the link to Guelph actually is my dad, he did his master's of science and microbiology at Guelph. And so ah. I was like, oh, this feels like a little bit of a, a connection that way. So fantastic. Um, yeah. But I want to I want to get a sense of the beginnings of, of um, you know not only your research but like did, did was this sort of an extension of anything from you know growing up or were you eating dirt dirt by the <laughs> handfuls or what what was that like No, in fact, I I, I consider the my sort of childhood and my microbiome through my childhood anyway to be pretty terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I suffered from infantile eczema. Um, I wasn't breastfed. I tell my mum that all the time just to make her feel guilty. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it was a kind of a normal thing in the 70s, though. Um, I, um, uh, I, I had problems with, uh, with weight gain as a child, uh, which kind of persisted through to adulthood. And I've managed to make to sort of uh, uh, control it a little bit. And um, I had uh, an irritable bowel, so I got very sick when I was uh, anxious about anything. And, uh, and and if I think about it, I also took a lot of antibiotics. Mm. And that, that was not, you know, I'm not blaming my poor parents. I think my mum was, uh, you know, every time I got a sniffle, I was down the doctors. And, and in those days, the doctors would say, oh, here, just take these antibiotics. Right. So I do wonder whether my gut has kind of been ravaged by that. And actually, um, a few years ago, um, uh, I have a colleague, Rob Knight, who runs something called the American Gut Project. And uh, so I was down in San Diego where he is, and um, he was giving out some free kits for the American Gut Project and said, hey, do you want to try it? So I did. Um, so I got my results back. And uh, I mean, I'd already looked at my gut microbiome, but uh, but this was an opportunity for me to look at it in comparison to other Americans. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I found, you know, I, I kind of fit there right in with all the other American, you know, Westerners. Um, but uh, but I, I have a microbiome that's fairly rich, at least from that uh, sample, because, uh, of course, that's just one sample. Um, it's fairly rich in microbes that I probably shouldn't uh, like very much. And so um, mm. I do try very hard to uh, to eat really well and to exercise and to do all the things now that we know that are good for the microbiome. And uh, But I haven't recently checked my microbiome to see if I've made a difference. And that's something that you think, well, why wouldn't I do that? I've got all the, <laughs> the tools at my uh, at my disposal to do that. And I think it's just because I'm so busy is one of the mm-hmm. things. And, and also, I'd have to ask one of my students to do it. And I think I find that that's a little bit, you know, <laughs> it's, probably, it's going a bit above and beyond. So, um, 
so I don't know what it is, but uh, but I do feel very uh, very much like uh, I have improved my gut health in the last few years through some of the mm. things that I've done. But it's certainly not a healthy gut, and uh, and that has driven me a little bit. My um, eldest daughter also suffers from irritable bowel. When she was a baby, uh, although she was breastfed, uh, it's when she was a baby, she um, uh, had a lot of problems with uh, strep throat and uh, tonsillitis, and so she was on a lot of antibiotics as well. Whereas my youngest daughter has never had an antibiotic in her life, and I'm very proud to say that, uh, mm. uh, except for one very short course of um, of a uh, uh, of an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection, which uh, which I made sure was a drug that uh, didn't go through the gut, uh, is uh, sort of concentrated more in the urinary tract, and uh, as a result, you know, she's really fit and healthy, and uh, and you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, that's an N of one, right? So I can't really right, correlate. Right, right. Uh, but uh, um, she won't let me look at her gut microbiome, and you know, that's fair. So <laughs> maybe when she's a bit older, uh, she might uh, appreciate that a bit more. But uh, but my eldest daughter is is showing it interest now so can the the average person we can actually um you talked about the, this american gut project but is there uh, the average person <laughs> can go and pay to to understand what their their microbiome looks like Yes, absolutely. And, and actually, it's a really good plug for Rob's project, actually, because okay. it's, a, it's a fabulous project. Um, it's called the American Gut Project, and uh, you can just search for it online. Uh, I think it's been on hiatus recently because of COVID-related mm. you know, fears, mm. because of, obviously that's a, uh, a risk if you're sending samples through the post. Mm. But basically, you have a, um, a sample, you, you go to the toilet, you wipe some of the uh, fecal matter onto the stick, and you put it in, mm. a, in a pot, and you send it off, and a few weeks later, you'll get like a readout of uh, what your microbiome looks like and what it looks like more importantly compared to the rest of the uh, the, the other American population that have been studied as, as well as some a few other kind of non-Americans as well so it's kind of interesting to see um, and the project is actually that the, it, it's very much a citizen science project it is not designed to be at all diagnostic for any kind of disease. I think there's been a little bit of, um, they've had some trouble because people have been using it like that and sort of getting their test results and then running to their doctor and saying, hey, look, I've got these. I, you know, this microbe, I need to get rid of it. Give me an antibiotic. And that's not the intent. Uh, and so uh, really what it is, is it's more really for benefiting science because when the project started, we really didn't have much of an idea of what, uh, of the variation of the microbiome across the population. Um, and so this was a sort of a grassroots attempt to rectify that. And one of the tricky parts of doing that is you have to make sure that the methods that you use to measure the microbiome are the same throughout because mm -hmm. there's all sorts of biases introduced if you use a slightly different method. Uh, so that's the one thing that the American Gut Project has done is maintain those methods so that that variation is, is now gone. And, uh, and the data set that's coming out, which is uh, also publicly available for research, is, um, is, is just... Um, phenomenal so uh, so I encourage people to get involved there is a cost involved I think I, I can't remember how much it is I think it might be something in the region of 100 US dollars but it mm -hmm. might be different um, but uh, and, and that is really just to kind of offset the cost of running a project like this um, it's not designed to be making money for and certainly Rob isn't making money out of it um, but it's uh, it really just helps with the upkeep of the um, of the project, and I think it's uh, I think it's fabulous, and I hope that it continues. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask you about. Just, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned it that uh, about whether it could be used for as a diagnostic test. Uh, so it sounds like it's mainly it's mostly to really gather an inventory and to really understand, yep. um, you know, the microbiome across you know a, a bunch of samples. But but is there is there a pathway to 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 making this more of a diagnostic test because I would mm. think that that would be something that would be useful. Perhaps. Yes. Yes. That, so that's a really good question. And I'm glad you asked it because I'm asked this all the time. So is there a diagnostic test? Or oftentimes I get, uh, I get some sent uh, sort of request to, can, can you sequence my poop in your lab? And I'm like, well, number one, I can't because that's <laughs> not what my lab does. But uh, number two, there's, a, there's some real dangers associated with that. Um, and one of them is that what are people going to do with the information that they get? And mm -hmm. so what I'm seeing is that there are some private labs popping up that will uh, propose to 
to you know sample your gut microbiome and uh, usually stool sample and uh, tell you what microbes you have and then tell you a bunch of stuff based on the results um, that I can tell you as a scientist are absolutely based in no fact whatsoever. Uh, mm. The methods that they're using are not very robust. Um, they don't seem to normalize anything. Um, and, and, and I think it's dangerous, honestly, because quite honestly, we don't know what a healthy gut is looks like. We don't have a definition mm. for a healthy gut right now. And that's one of the reasons for doing something like the American Gut Project. Uh, we need to sort of set the baseline for that. And because there is so much variation among a population, it's very, very difficult to draw comparisons. The other really dangerous thing, or the not dangerous, but uh, thing that people don't kind of appreciate is that when you do a test like that, you're taking a test in a, in a snapshot of time. And your microbiome, although it's very kind of homogenous and it stays very um, uh, similar through your life, it changes in its abundance profiles according to what you're eating. And um, that's one of the, the ways what, that it kind of What does of that mean copes. when you say abundance profile? So um, if you think about your microbiome as a sort of um, uh, a group of, uh, you know, 200 to 300 bacterial species, mm. at any one moment, the numbers of each species are going to be different. So okay. you're never going to have a ratio of one to one to one to one. Uh, in fact, actually, it's usually very much skewed that you only have like three or four taxa which are really dominant and the, the others are quite minimal. Um, and that changes according to what you eat. And the reason it changes uh, is because each of those microbes has a different kind of arsenal of enzymes to, uh, to break down the, the food that you eat. Mm. Um, obviously, we don't all eat exactly the same thing every day, or most of us don't. So, um, and, and that means that, um, that your microbiome changes in abundance uh, profiles every day, and uh, but it doesn't change in composition as much. So in other words, the same species are there, just the amounts of them are, are, are different. And so when you do a <laughs> diagnostic test, uh, you know the usually when people do a diagnostic test, they're looking for a taxon and they're thinking very much in terms of uh, infectious disease, for example. They're looking for something that's a quote-unquote bad microbe, and if mm. they see that in high numbers, then that's a bad thing. Uh, and the problem is that that's just frankly untrue. Um, because it, it all depends on the context. Mm. And so you're not getting context at all if you're taking one sample. And even if you're taking multiple samples, I'd argue that uh, you know the um, the interpretation of the results that you get is just it, it's not good enough right now. We just don't have the knowledge behind it, and that's actually one of the reasons why we don't. You know, Health Canada doesn't have a test right now that mm. they're sanctioned or or um, uh, for for testing because there isn't nothing like that exists. Sure. So um, I you know I would sort of say to people who want to do that kind of thing to save your money. Uh, you know, there are lots of tests for pathogens out there which have been sanctioned and very clearly, um, uh, you know, shown to be effective. Uh, and, the, and doctors have access to those all the time. But looking at the microbiome is a very, very different beast for many other reasons I could uh, suggest as well. And perhaps another one is that just knowing the species that you have in your gut microbiome doesn't tell you the whole story because you can have multiple strains of one type of species which are incredibly different to each other. So mm. it's, it's, it's more about gene carriage. And, and uh, so if we look at the microbiome in general, the gut microbiome in general, I would say that uh, if we took all the genetic material from the gut microbiome, we would only really understand what about 70, no, what about 30% of the genes are doing. 70% we would call dark matter uh, from the point of view that we recognize that they're genes, we recognize that they code for proteins, but we have no idea what those proteins do. And so again, it kind of makes it really tricky to, uh, to kind of translate that to health. And uh, it will be quite a few years before I think we're, we're at the point where we can get a test for, um, uh, for microbiome right. health. Yes, I was going to say, I mean, it sounds like it's almost impossible to establish what a baseline would look like for somebody's uh, gut microbiome. Like, here's what your standard, it's like, um, yeah. you could maybe find out, you know, what those 200 or 300 species are that sort of exist within you. But anything beyond that, with any form of consistency, at least for even a, a diagnostic, por um, um, diagnostic purposes or, um, you know, overall gut health would be almost impossible at this point, sounds like. 
Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the thing that there is hope, though, because I don't want people to sort of think that, oh, <laughs> this is just like a waste of time. Why are we, why are we even bothering? Uh, one thing that we have found is that um, there is some what we call functional redundancy in the microbiome. And what functional redundancy is, is just a sort of, um, it's a kind of complicated term, I guess. But what it means is that you have multiple microbes within your gut microbiome that carry out the same function. Uh, some of them might do it more efficiently under one set of circumstances than others. Uh, but essentially, you don't just have one microbe that does one thing and another microbe that does another thing. Uh, a lot of mm. the processes are shared. And so what does that mean? That, that means that uh, if you have a healthy gut microbiome anyway, uh, you have resilience, which means that if something happens to your microbiome, say you get a terrible case of um, norovirus or something like that, you're not going to completely lose all of your microbiome. It will come back and, um, and it will recover. And that, that resilience, that uh, response to perturbation is one of the measures of resilience. So um, one of the things that, that we're very interested in, especially in my lab, is not what the microbes are, it's what they're doing. It's, we always say this, it's what they're doing that's important. And microbes are not kind of static entities that just kind of sit there and churn out, you know, a bunch of stuff. They, they're very responsive to their environment. They're very, they're very intelligent uh, from, you know, in a different kind of intelligent. They don't have brains, obviously. But uh, to me, I think that it's, it's, they're incredible little creatures that, uh, you know, just single-celled organisms for bacteria, uh, for example, that, uh, that can sense their environment and respond to it incredibly uh, well. And so when you have a bunch of microbes or a bunch of bacteria, for, for example, that can do that, what you end up with is a very finely tuned ecosystem that can respond really well to the environment that it's, that it's uh, within. And so from the point of view of a diagnostic test, I would predict in the future that the sorts of tests that we're going to see are not measuring what's there, but we're measuring what they're doing. So we're looking at the, uh, and one of the things, one of the ways to do that is to look at what we call the metabolic output. So we look at the metabolites that have been produced by the microbes and, and not worry too much about who made them. Right, because some microbes, uh, you know, there, there might be multiple microbes making the same molecule, uh, but uh, the overall effect will be just, you know, will, will be the important thing, and that's what your body is going to respond to. And that's also important from the point of view that, um, for the most part, your your body is is uh, is in sort of balance with your microbiome. Uh, you know, you have a very kind of finely tuned immune system to keep those microbes out of the sterile parts of your body. So um, how do the microbes communicate with you? Uh, it turns out that it, it, it seems to be through the molecules that they make because those molecules are easily absorbed by the body and some of them have amazing effects on physiology. Uh, that's very well established. Uh, some molecules, especially ones called short chain fatty acids, one of them is butrate and everyone's talking about butrate right now and how important butrate is. Well, we know that butrate has a very important effect on physiology, but it's one of many thousands of molecules that are produced by the microbiome that we know nothing about. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do, uh, but I imagine that a lot of those molecules are going to be quite important to, to human physiology. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in my lab is to kind of figure that out, at least. Uh, I don't think we'll ever figure it all out, but I think uh, we'll at least be able to contribute to the, to the jigsaw puzzle. So ha yeah. have there right. been any scientific links? And I, I think I know the answer to this, um, any concrete scientific links outside of hypotheses, because it, it uh, stands to reason to me sort of what you said before, about having a healthy gut likely will reduce other instances of things like IBS, things like maybe even colitis or whatever it is. Um, what does the literature say on that right now as far as um, proven hypotheses? And is it... Um, it's hard to establish a baseline right now. So I imagine that yeah. to, to form any concrete correlation between those two things is probably quite difficult. Has there, um, how do you view that playing out here over the next couple yeah. of years or, um, you know, lifetimes, it sounds like, because there's just a ton of work <laughs> in this field. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, there's a ton of work, but there's a ton of new researchers coming into the field, and I'm so pleased mm. to see it because I think that's what we need. You know, we need to crowdsource this uh, this effort, and and that's what's happening. So hopefully, it won't be too long before these kinds of things are um, are translated. And I think um, so. Uh, 
I think it's very difficult. I mean, that there's a lot of research out there, and it, and it depends on the indication. Uh, but one of the things which has come out, which seems to be kind of universal across the whole uh, spectrum of diseases, and I'm not just talking about gut diseases. I'm also talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, neurological diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, and several others, is that they seem to be associated with, and I use that word very strongly, associated with, because this has not been proven yet, uh, but associated with lower diversity in the, in the gut microbiome, mm -hmm. okay? And so um, the problem is we don't, again, we don't have a definition for what, what is the perfect amount of diversity in the, in the human gut. And that's, uh, you know, obviously something that we're working on. But what we do know is that if you compare people with a given disease, let's say Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, one of the IBDs, and you compare their gut microbiotas to people who are healthy, or don't have those diseases, uh, because I, I've, I hesitate to say healthy in a Western perspective because I think most of us are not healthy. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but what you'll find is that those who suffer with IBD have a much lower gut microbial diversity. And so the problem there is that it, the question has always been, is that cause or effect? You know, so an IBD is obviously a disease where there's sorts of um, bouts and, you know, relapsing, remitting uh, bouts of diarrhea and, um, and ulceration and obviously gut damage. And so we don't know whether that loss of diversity led to that sequelae or whether that sequelae led to the loss of diversity or both. And so it becomes very tricky. But as time has gone on and we are looking more at diseases now which don't have a um, component that is really, you know, gut, uh, you know, that, 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 that is shown through gut disease, uh, let's take neurological disease, for example, let's take depression and anxiety, then that's the same thing. We see a lack of uh, diversity and we see... Um, microbes that can sometimes be depleted and they seem to be depleted in groups of people uh, but the problem is it's not black and white so it's not like we can suddenly say oh this person with depression hasn't got any acomancia you know which is a very uh, up-and-coming uh, beneficial microbe in the gut and so what we need to do is just give them some acomancia and that will make them better uh, I'm, I don't think it's going to be that easy <laughs> uh, and, and part of the problem there is that microbes don't work in isolation in the gut microbial context, they're part of a community, and as part of a community, they work together and there's synergy. And so we, we have to be um, – unfortunately, I think a lot of microbiology is based in the field of uh, – in, in clinical microbiology is based in the field of infectious disease, where we are used to thinking about infectious diseases, you know, one microbe causing a problem. Uh, it's very difficult to think about ecological terms in disease, I think. And so, um, and so how on earth do we start to kind of look at that? How on earth do we start to sort of uh, figure out what should be there and, and make it better? And uh, I think that that's kind of where the cutting edge is right now. And, um, and there are some trials, you know, that are being done. And, and, and my company is, is one of them that is doing these trials to try to put microbes back uh, into, um, into people. And, and, and certainly there have been studies of, of probiotics, uh, specific strains of beneficial, micro, uh, beneficial uh, bacteria that have been given to people with depression and anxiety, for example, and mm -hmm. shown to have an effect, uh, moderate usually. Uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not an overnight success story by any means. Uh, and there's, uh, there's also a lot of um, animal data out there, especially in mouse models. And uh, those seem to be very promising. Of course, the problem is we've, we've, you know, we've cured cancer in mice, but we can't yet do that in humans. Mm. And so yeah. uh, that's because a mouse and a human are very different. But they're still useful models and still, again, adding pieces to the puzzle. So I think um, we, we're kind of getting there, um, but we, we don't know yet what causes disease. And so because we don't know what causes disease, um, fixing it is not a, a, a a defined science, if you like. And even, like I say, the companies like mine that are trying to create drugs, which, you know, live microbial products, um, it's, it's very much a, um, uh, it, it, it's tricky because we, we're kind of bound by a couple of um, uh, problems there because there you, you're working with a, um, 
uh, a set of criteria you're trying to make a drug and to make a drug you can't make a you know a drug for every single individual that's different for every single individual right. but yeah. every single individual has a different gut microbiome so how do we know whether the drug product that we produce is going to have an effect for a given individual so i think we're kind of at the intersection now of microbiome science and personalized medicine and and you know grappling with how we can we can figure that out but we don't have all of the pieces in place yet so the, the it's not particularly clear uh what's going on but um you know and, and i think at best right now we can make a difference to a group of people hmm. but we can't take an entire group of people with ibd for example and 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 cure them all you know it, that that's not where we're at it, Oh, there's just so much. That so you exciting! Like, yeah, like it's so, that sounds so <laughs> exciting. Honestly, like I, oh, I hope that I hope Emma that you come back, um, <laughs> Kyle. We have to keep doing this podcast so we can have Emma back next year or something. Because I'm just so excited to hear about like that whole lineage and like where it's headed, right? And all the positive yeah. effects. Obviously, you know, it's um, it's it's not concrete, but just really, really exciting just to hear that trend. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to come to the piece on diversity because yes. uh, it's really really interesting when you said that um, you know maybe there's a there's a assumption out there that um, one micro does one thing as a res- uh, as opposed to what you said is like there's this interdependency and they they work together in this kind of community and and you can't just um, you know if you see a lack of abundance in one microbe you can't just all of a sudden introduce um, you know that microbe and expect everything to kind of just work out because it works in this community and my head just goes you know t- to go outside the human microbiome is like that's almost like a good model for society right like it just seems like like diversity in the microbiome it seems to be a really important characteristic of a healthy functioning gut um what's to say that that's not an important aspect of our society right like that's where my head was going is is um we're noticing diversity is such an important part of resilience and organizations and 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 like society and, and other aspects of life so it seems like it's a really good it could be a potential really good model for other aspects of our life yeah yeah you know it's funny you say that because i have an analogy that i use when i teach this stuff and and it's it's the it's the starbucks analogy so you know if you have a a a new city and you just populate it with starbucks on every corner then you're all all you're going to end up with is a a community of people who like you know who who can drink coffee Mm -hmm. but they can't do much else uh if you provide other coffee shops or other types of uh, beverage stop shops even uh then uh then you're going to diversify what uh, what people can try and you're going to end up with a much more kind of um varied uh population and i think uh, so you know it it is very important and i suppose another analogy that we could draw is um it's the it's actually in the agriculture business you know we have in especially in canada swathes and swathes of land which are just uh, colonized by one plant that we're raising and Mm -hmm. and what Mm -hmm. we're seeing as a result of that um and you know i I can't speak too much to this literature because i don't know it as well as i know my own but uh but certainly the soil microbiome is depleted as a result of that and what what is that going to do what is that doing and and we know just as little about probably even less about the soil microbiome than we know about the gut microbiome and yet we've been gradually destroying it and so what is that going to do for us i think it's going to end up making um plants which are less resilient to disease uh because the um the microbiome of the rhizosphere which is the area around the roots of a plant is actually really important to the health of a plant mm. and we didn't even realize that uh until fairly recently mm. you know the, the damage is done uh so how can we fix that and actually i've got colleagues at you know guelph obviously uh, being an agricultural university who study that kind of thing and i really do think that there's a future in replacing microbiome in the soil to uh, to maintain plant health so it's a kind of analogy for that as well yeah when you're when you're uh when you're figuring out your research or even as you as you uh, think about um the research questions that you're asking have you ever thought about um how the microbiome may have developed over the course of human history or or the lifestyles that people yes. would have taken to um you know maybe unconsciously or consciously 
um, to, to help their, their microbiome, right? Like, you, you know, you think of the thought of like fermented foods, you know, is, is a very, you know, now it's a trendy thing, but there, there are cultures who have survived for, you know, generations and generations of living on fermented foods. And one could say maybe it was an unconscious way of, of supporting their microbiome, or maybe it was just in, in the matter of how they preserve their foods. Um, but have you ever, has your research ever been guided in, or have you ever thought about sort of, I'm laughing. I'm laughing okay. because you you have hit on something which has become a really, it's becoming a really big area in my research lab right now, uh, and that is the idea. Uh, so bear with me a minute. I'll take you the, on the journey, and then you can see where I'm ending up. Um, so uh, knowing that diversity is really important in the gut. Um, one of the really interesting ideas that's sort of been put forward in the last few um, years is that uh, because our lifestyles are in the Western world anyway are so uh, sterile almost, it's you know we have a lot of uh, lifestyle implementations that actually damage microbes. You know we, we're not intending to do that; it's not an intentional thing, uh, but um, but it happens. You know even things like refrigerating food and uh, or chemically treating food or mm -hmm. living in a clean environment and, and all of those kinds of things actually. Um, we think over time is damaging our microbiome and uh, mm -hmm. and our gut if you think about that in the terms of the gut microbiome as i do you think well um what do these uh, so when when this happens are micro microbes going extinct so you have to think about first of all where the microbes come from in the first place you know when you develop and so you're sterile until you're born basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you pick up a lot of microbes usually from your mother during that uh, process of birth and just mm -hmm. uh, just afterwards uh, some from your siblings a lot from your environment um, but what happens if your mother and your siblings and your environment are already depleted in microbiome? Mm. Uh, so that depletion kind of carries on through generations because of the lifestyle implementations we have. I think I missed out a big one. The big one is antibiotic use. Mm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's far more dam damaging than anything else. So, um, so there's this idea that uh, although we have managed to tame infectious disease um, in, a, in a big way, and that's a big you know, success story of the industrial age, uh, what we're seeing now is an increase in chronic disease. And so things like heart disease and autism and, um, you know, many others, depression, you know, that there's a whole range of diseases that whose um, uh, prevalence is rising even above the, um, the rates that we might consider through things like changes in diagnostic criteria. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the, this, these uh, sort of, Theories that have come that that, have, that has come up has actually been uh, led by a guy called Marty Blazer, um, and uh, he wrote a book um, not too long ago called Missing Microbes, and it's I recommend it uh, as a uh, as a really good primer on this kind of thing. Uh, but basically, what he's saying is maybe what the problem is is that our microbiome members of our microbiome who who remember do important metabolic work for us are going extinct, and as they're going extinct there are fewer microbes in our gut microbiomes that can do this important metabolic work that we don't yet recognize, and, uh, and that can somehow lead to disease. So I told you I was going to take you on a journey. So here's, a, here's the part of the journey that's really fun. So one of the big questions is, well, how do we know that this is true? And so what research has started to do about 10 years ago is start looking at populations of uh, people who live a non-traditional lifestyle, or a, sorry, a, a non-Western lifestyle, a more traditional lifestyle mm -hmm. um, around the globe. And, and what do we mean by this? So um, we're, we're not just sort of meaning people who suddenly start to, who live in the West and suddenly start to drink kefir and, and uh, you know, live that kind of paleo <laughs> lifestyle. We're talking about people who've lived that their entire lives and so have their ancestors. And if you, if you look around the world at those kinds of peoples, they're very few and far between now. They're almost extinct themselves. Um, but they do exist. And the, the, the real... Um, the ones that have been studied the most, I think, have uh, arguably have been the Hadza tribes people in Tanzania, uh, in uh, in Africa. And when you look at their gut microbiomes, they are incredibly diverse, far mm. more diverse than we would see in the Western world. Uh, and added to that, there are microbes present in their guts um, that we have never seen in the Western world. Uh, so the question then is, okay, so now we know that these people have never been exposed, for the most part, to antibiotics or 
clean lifestyle. They live a, they live very much on the land, as it were, mm-hmm. uh, from the land. They're hunter gatherers for the most part. They don't farm very much, uh, or if at all. And so when you start looking at that, does that mean that those microbes that their guts harbor are the microbes that went extinct from our guts when we started transitioning to a more kind of um, uh, Western lifestyle? Mm-hmm. And so that's a really yeah. interesting question. And so the way, so so I'm now very much in this field um, just through luck, I think, and um, because I I'm very interested in these missing microbes. For me, it's like, what are these missing microbes doing? Uh, do they have functions which are really important? And in order to understand function, you need to be able to culture microbes, and that's one thing that's. Um, uh, missing a little bit because you can imagine it's very very hard mm-hmm. to go to these places and actually bring back live samples of microbes which tend to be very sort of anaerobic very oxygen sensitive and mm. you know, all the problems that are involved there uh, it's also very difficult ethically to sample uh, these populations without uh, wanting to appear that you're exploiting them you need to make sure that these people understand what we're doing and that mm. uh, you know that that we're not uh, that, that we're doing this for research purposes not to make money mm-hmm. uh, and and if it uh, if there is any sort of money to be made it needs to go back to these people you know sure. this is this is mm-hmm. uh, this is the knowledge <clears throat> that they have so um a couple of years ago, um, I was uh, looking actually originally to sample some of the Hadza people through some uh, colleagues that I have, uh, and that just didn't pan out because it's incredibly difficult to do mm. and difficult to organize. And then, um, but just through complete serendipity, and I think life is wonderful like this sometimes, um, I was contacted by uh, someone who was working with something called the Good Project. And uh, this is a... Um, a not for, no, not for profit that is run by David Good, and David Good is a uh, is a young biologist whose father he has a unique heritage. His father is a um, uh, <coughs> is an anthropologist, or was a was an anthropologist. He's retired now, and uh, he spent a lot of time in the uh, Amazon jungle in Venezuela mm. uh, with a tribe of Yanomami individuals, and uh, it, back in the eighties. And um, he um, he learned the language. He kind of lived among them. He was uh, doing his PhD, studying that diet. <clears throat> it was a really, you know, it's a in- very, really interesting story. But what was more interesting is he fell in love with one of the tribeswomen. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, uh, it brought her back to the U.S. Can you imagine? This woman had never, you know, <laughs> seen what, no. anything. You know, they, they literally live. Um, in you know in the jungle in right. a very remote part of, of Venezuela, and uh, anyway, uh, long story short, because this is not really my story to tell, and he's written a book on this, and National Geographic have done do- documentaries. Uh, the product of this relationship was David, and so David is half Yanomami. And uh, his mother went back to the jungle because she couldn't cope with life in the U.S. as you not might imagine. Not surprisingly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, um, and not before having two other children. So David mm-hmm. has a brother and a sister. And, uh, but they, they were all raised in the U.S. David then, uh, you know, later on in life, he's written his own memoir as well. Uh, and that's also fascinating to read. But, uh, but one of the things that he did is he went back to the jungle to find his mother. Uh, a few years back and, mm. and absolutely incredibly managed to find her because they're a nomadic tribe mm-hmm. uh, so it's not like he knew where he would find them it was wow. all done through word of mouth so he reconnected with his um, Yanomami family in the jungle and uh, because he's a biologist now he's like interested in the microbiome mm. so um, in 2019 he did an expedition and uh, and at the time he was sort of saying you know we, were, we got talking to each other we'd, we'd made contact by that point and i said you know it'd be great if we could bring back some live poop samples from the jungle uh with all the you know right permits in place and because david because of david's heritage and because he's a venezuelan he has venezuelan citizenship uh that makes it a lot ethically a lot better i mean he's done this in the right way uh, and so we sent him to the jungle with some, you know, tubes and sampling kits. And, uh, and, and uh, he had this sort of like little generator thing and a solar powered um, uh, cool box and basically collected, you know, the, the, his family who's, who, he, who uh, agreed to give samples were just, just thought he was completely mad, but uh, sort of picked onto a banana leaf and he brought it, he brought it all back. And it was a very, you know, one day we'll write a story about this. I hey, think David, just one quick yeah. favor from you before you go. <laughs>
Yeah. Here's all this exactly. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, man. well, actually, you know, a plug for David. He, uh, when he wears his back, when, when he uh, went on this expedition, he actually had a film crew follow him, and he's uh, uh, put together a documentary, and uh, that's oh, cool. now being entered into the Sundance Festival. So I really hope oh, that cool. it's, uh, it gets some traction there, because uh, what he's done is frankly incredible. So, you know, again, long story short, the samples finally made it to my lab. Uh, for a very convoluted route, you can imagine the amount of permits I needed mm. and everything. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they they got into my lab, and, and we had no idea how successful we would be with culturing these things. But we have this uh, this robo gut platform that, that you mentioned, mm. uh, which is a really good way of making microbes from the gut feel at home in a lab environment. Uh, so we basically created a diet for the uh, for these microbes. Uh, from looking at what the Yanomami eat, which is mostly tubers and um, root vegetables, a lot of fiber, plantains, mm -hmm. things like that. So we actually ordered a lot of those um, products from Amazon, but not the Amazon, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, made these diets, put them in the robogut, grew the microbes, and astoundingly, we've managed to recover quite a lot of bacterial diversity, including some of those microbes that are missing microbes that we've never seen in the Western world before. Wow. So now we have a real opportunity, and this is really new work. Um, you know, we haven't published it yet, but this is a real opportunity now for us to start thinking, well, okay, what are the microbes do because it's mm. not about what they are it's what they're doing and so we have a really good opportunity now to do that and and uh, and just to sort of finish off that story two anecdotes one of them is that i then took david on as my phd student so he started with me in september as a phd student which is awesome yeah. so uh, very i'm very pleased about that because he actually will get to work with you know his family sample this is what he's interested in and this is you know it's beneficial for all and the second thing is that I've been working as well with Alex Kostich at um, Harvard University at the Jolson um, Center for Diabetes there. And uh, so Alex has done some very cool work recently that he's published. Um, uh, and Alex is another Canadian, by the way, so you know, mm -hmm. plug for the Canadians. Yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> he, um, what he has done is he has taken, uh, he's found some samples of what we call paleo feces. So this is fossilized human poop that has been preserved in usually very dry areas like caves and things like that, and been able to extract DNA from it and to sequence it. And you can tell that it's ancient DNA because it's pretty damaged, but you can mm. use computer algorithms to kind of fix that damage and you can see what's there. When you look, so he's, he's done this for, I think, six or seven samples from caves in, in um, south, southern U.S. and uh, Mexico. And what he found was, uh, was microbes which were very, very different, again, from what we see in the Western world. And so when he heard what I was doing with the Yanomami uh, samples that we have, you know, we only had a handful of samples from there as well. But we, we carried out a process which we call metagenomic sequencing, which is basically we take all of the DNA in the sample and we sequence the hell out of it, basically, and then ask a computer to put it all back together uh, on itself. And uh, you can then sort of see what's there. And when Alex, who's the, you know, he's the, um, he's very good with bioinformatics, I'm not. Uh, but when he compared the, um, uh, if you compare the Western world, so the, all the metagenomic samples we have from the, from, uh, the Human Microbiome Project, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compare that to the ancient samples, they were very different. And when you compare the Yanomami samples to the ancient samples, they were almost identical. So wow, it really wow. feels like what we have uncovered here is a bit of a time capsule yes. that might be able to, bet, to let us see in real life terms, because obviously paleofaeces is long dead, uh, but now we have the opportunity to look at these microbes, these live microbes, and their functions in the context of um, uh, human evolution. <clears throat> and so, uh, so fingers crossed. We've just put a grant together. It goes in on Wednesday. So hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get some funding to really look at this. But I think this is a real opportunity to find out what these missing microbes are doing. How old are these ancient samples? Sorry. So they're around about two thousand years old. Uh, they, I think, up to two thousand years old. And actually, there was a paper. It's funny because uh, I, I was just sent this paper this morning, and I thought this is so prescient. But there was a paper that was published this week in Cell. Um, and what they did is they also looked at ancient paleofaeces, this time in Europe. 
Mm. And um, and they were able to reconstruct not only the diets of, uh, you know, ancient, they were salt miners, and that's how they managed to preserve the feces, because they found them in the salt mines, and obviously there's a lot less water in the salt mines, so a lot less damage to the DNA. And uh, again, they see very diverse ecosystems, uh, very different to modern day Europeans. And uh, actually, they also saw the first evidence for uh, that these that these people 2000 years ago were drinking beer and eating blue cheese <laughs> because you can <laughs> see the microbes that were used to uh, ferment those foods. And so, you know, another really important fast. I think we can learn so much from looking at these kinds of samples. Unbelievable. So, so. If I'm hearing correctly, the ancient samples are not much different from like when you talk about the tribe in the Amazon, which is like fairly modern day sample. Like you said, it's, yep. just, it's just something that you guys have just uncovered recently. There's very little difference. Yes. And so, and so, um, not to jump to a conclusion, but am I? It, can one interpret it as something has happened in in our lifestyle or diets in? you know, whether Western diets or Western lifestyles that may have altered the microbiome potentially for the negative? Could one maybe yeah. arrive almost at that conclusion? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, well, that's the, that's the immediate conclusion that, we, that you'd want to arrive at, but we have right. to be very careful there. Because if you think about, uh, I don't want anyone to think that industrialization has been a bad thing because, you know, we've made amazing technological advances because of it. Um, but we've also changed our lifestyles to the extent that we're seeing, you know, big differences. So it's, it, that there's, I think it's to do with, uh, um, I think, I think what we've got to think about is that it, it may not be necessarily negative, uh, because there are some microbes that we see in the Western world that we don't see at all in the, in the ancient, um, samples which are of the animami, which seems to be beneficial. And, okay. and the big one there is something called bifidobacterium. And bifidobacterium is something that is actually, as it's a species of many, uh, um, or, or, or genus, and, and the many species and strains of that genus are used as probiotics. Um, bifidobacteria are what we call lactic acid bacteria. Yeah. Uh, they mm -hmm. produce lactic acid as a, um, uh, as part of the fermentation of lactose. And lactose comes from milk. And what's interesting here is that, um, one, you know, one of the Western practices we do is we drink milk, we eat dairy products, and that does not happen uh, in the Anamami. They don't do that. That's, mm -hmm. uh, pro in fact, they find that disgusting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the only milk that they would um, uh, consume would be breast milk from, uh, you know, as, a, as an infant. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so it's, it may be uh, that what we're seeing is, um, you know, loss of potentially beneficial microbes. I really, you know, I hypothesize that, but we haven't proven that yet. Or it may be that the Western microbiome has just evolved to cope with the different dietary um, uh, sources that we have. I mean, the Western diet is way more diverse than the Anamami diet. The Anamami mm. diet is way higher in fiber. So it's, you know, you, it's difficult to say what's best. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, the best microbiome is the one that can utilize the most types of substrates and produce the most types of beneficial metabolites. And, of course, we don't have a definition for that, as I, as mm -hmm. I mentioned at the beginning. So it's very difficult. So, you know, what, you know one of the things that, um, that people say to me is like, oh, well, then what I want, I want some of those Yanomami micros. I'll just re recolonize my gut with the Yanomami micros. And I'm like, that is the last thing you want to do. <laughs> uh, because, number one, your, your immune system has not developed uh, alongside this ecosystem. So you could be doing yourself untold damage. Uh, you could cause all sorts of problems. And number two, you do not eat a Yanomami diet. Uh, and so if the microbes are tuned to the diet that you eat, then, um, you know, unless you start just sort of eating tubers and plantains all the time, then it's probably not going to do you much good. So I think we have to be very careful about sort of, um, you know, sort of saying, oh, well, there's, we, we're missing microbes and, oh, look, we found some of these missing microbes. And look, all we've got to do is replace the missing microbes because mm. I don't think it's quite as simple of a formula. Yeah, those bacteria would have no idea what to do with a cheeseburger and fries, probably. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so our second child, um, he, he's six months now, but the first six weeks of his life, he um, he was a bit of a grumpy fella, and he didn't qualify for call. He didn't cry for whatever the, you know, the three hours a day, three times a week, whatever it was. But we looked into it just to see. 
And when you research colic, you find out that it's not something that happens to every culture across the world. It's only endemic to, to certain parts of the world. And it's um, most heavily located, I think, in North America or uh, places with Western diets. And so now what you've told me about these very different uh, microbiota in, in other cultures, much more diverse um, uh, microbiota in other cultures, makes me think that that might be, and obviously this is just a schmuck taking a guess, but, um, you know, because cause oftentimes uh, colic, they think might be due to some form of uh, gastrointestinal issues as the baby learns to kind of have, um, digest the milk from the mother. But that doesn't happen everywhere. And so I would think now maybe that, you know, in, if other cultures aren't experiencing this, and it is linked to some form of gastrointestinal piece, there could be reason to believe that maybe that's due to these different microbiota. Anyways, yeah, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I kind of, I, I agree. Um, and and again, I think colic is one of the infantile colic. Anyway, is one of the um, diseases or conditions that have been looked at in the context of a gut microbiome and diversity and diversity is reduced in in babies who have colic compared to those who don't hmm. um, I think the, the the problem that we have there is that we don't yet know how microbiomes develop and what's the best trajectory for that uh, I think um, there you know when a baby is born uh, they they um, they, as I said, they, they pick up a lot of microbes from the birth canal of their mother uh, and then they're breastfed um, uh, with, uh, with luck. I know that that's not possible all the time, but breast milk actually contains an awful lot of compounds which are um, uh, important for microbes. They're food for microbes. We can't actually digest some of these molecules ourselves. So why would we actually produce milk that contains these molecules? And the reason seems to be to support the gut microbiome and the developing gut microbiome. Microbiome, and so actually there is a um, um, a relationship between um, uh, uh, babies who are formula fed and colic that seems to be more of a risk factor. Mm. Um, mm. Not to say, and that the problem here, of course, is that you know the best way to feed a baby is to feed a baby. And so the last thing we want to do is to guilt mothers into thinking that because they didn't breastfeed mm -hmm. their baby, they somehow did something wrong. But I think at the same time, we do need to recognize that breast milk is best. Um, and, uh, and there are some things that can be done now with uh, formula companies are actually starting to introduce what are they called these human milk oligosaccharides into formula. Although they're not doing it in a particularly broad way. You know, there's, there's hundreds of human milk oligosaccharide compounds and they're, they're adding one of them <laughs> into formula food. And, and so that's better, but not quite there. So I do think there's a lot of room to improve formula milk. Um, and um, and I think that that will potentially uh, potentially help the situation with colic, for example. Um, the other thing, of course, is that um, some babies are born by C-section, and that mm -hmm. again is through no fault of the mother. Um, uh, but when but we do know that those microbiomes in those babies that are born by C-section are often not the same as you would see, or not or, or more similar to the sort of skin microbiome um, than uh, than they would be to the vaginal mm. microbiome as you might expect. Mm -hmm. And there's even some um, work being done to, uh, you know, if a baby is born by C-section, to take a vaginal swab from the mother and kind of swab it all over the baby to mm -hmm. kind of cover them with the microbes, which does seem to result in some colonization with vaginal microbes. But, but it, it's not, it, it's, again, it's not a, <clears throat> it's not completely successful. And if you think about when babies are born vaginal, vaginally, um, birth takes a long period of time mm -hmm. uh, to the chagrin of most mothers, including <laughs> me. Uh, but those babies are swallowing microbes that entire time mm -hmm. as they're traveling through the birth canal. And so that seems to be a very important um, uh, process and, and pe period of time, uh, kind of critical period for, for microbes to be picked up uh, from a baby um, uh, to, uh, from a mother to an infant. And it's not just in, it's, it's all mammals, right? Um, um, because um, some mammals, is, uh, I think my favorite story is the one of the whales, right? So, you know, whales, when, um, when baby whales are born, uh, how, you know, they, they latch on to their mother's uh, teats to feed. And that feeding process actually stimulates uh, defecation by the mother so that they basically get enveloped in a cloud of poop <laughs> while they're feeding. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, you've got to wonder why that is, but maybe that is actually a, um, uh, you know, something, something to do with this process, this important process of um, passing microbes on from mother to baby. So I think that in the future, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of interventions around the period of birth and, um, and, um, and, and ne the neonatal period. Uh, ostensibly to help infants and I think for the most part they are life-saving you know often c-sections are given to save the life of a woman and a child um, but we, we can do better if we know more about the microbes that are involved we can do better in terms of feeding an infant without making mothers feel guilty about not being able to breastfeed because that is a thing and you know that's mm -hmm. that's really uh, not something that we should be doing because honestly just feeding a baby is still better <laughs> for the baby than not feeding it uh, and formula milk is is way better these days than it, than it was even 10 years ago so we are making improvements to that but I do think that understanding the microbes role in all of this is really going to be helpful going forward and um, so yeah that's a, um, you know, my, my mind went to, again, the, how researchers are, are guided. Um, and you talk about, it sounds like, you know, there's this intentional process that happens when, when a baby moves down the, the birth canal of, of, of its mouth being open and, and, you know, inundating itself with all this flora. And, like, there's so much to learn by these sort of natural processes that have happened um, in terms of how you guide your research, and that, that's where I was going. But where I was also going, thinking about is um, just thinking about how we sustain our, our microbiota going forward. We talked about, you know, the diets and all that. But I, I wanted to get your thoughts on just COVID and, and, and the effect of, of, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, we're not, I don't want to get into the, the, um, the need to have all these infection prevention control measures um you know it's it's clearly important but I, I i do think about and i am concerned about the effect of all this on our microbiome yeah i i'm similarly worried um uh, for a long time i was telling people you know what are the what are could people always asking what can i do to maintain my microbiome and i was saying throw away your hand sanitizer right because that's probably it's a really it's it's not a good thing you you want to be encouraging your skin microbiome you you want to be doing all these things however you know that's not advice i would give right now because right. you always have to balance these kinds of things around the risk you know risk versus benefit and right now it's too high of a risk uh, COVID is a is a real thing. It's a real risk, and I think uh, you know. So so right now, I would say, okay, I use hand sanitizer, and I think you have to sometimes when you enter certain businesses and things like that. And I don't bulk at it, um, but I do. I am concerned about this. And and um, what can we do to fix this? Well, I think in COVID times, the the, the reality is we have to first of all. Uh, you know, make sure that we avert the risk of COVID. Get that out of the way and then, and then you know, uh, and then move on from there. I, what I'm very um, sad about, you know, almost is like I see little children right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, toddlers even, uh, playing. And I saw one in the park actually in the summertime and uh, uh, she was uh, just toddling along, just playing, playing around. And then she came to a post. It was just a post with a bin stuck to it, but it had like a little uh, sort of box on it that looked a bit like hand sanitizer to her. So she pretended to go and put her hand on it and then sort of rubbed her hands like this. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. to myself, she's conditioned to do this. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that is a, you know, right now it's a good thing, <laughs> right? Right. But it's also frightening because this child is going to grow up with this fear of, of germs, as it were, um, and, and a fear of COVID is, is valid. Uh, a fear of germs is not, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, or a fear of microbes is not. And I think uh, that's the big problem here. And I am very concerned about it. I don't know how we can fix that apart from through, uh, you know, education. This is not the time to do it. Uh, I think we have to wait for the COVID period to pass. We have to wait for people to hopefully get vaccinated and uh, and sort of, uh, you know, take the risk away. And then we need to start having conversations again about how we can keep our microbiome healthy. And so it's going to be years again. I think we've set ourselves back years in doing mm. this because the general public is um, – 
it's nervous, right? I mean, mm-hmm. COVID is a is a is a germ, it's a virus. You can't see it, and mm-hmm. and uh, and so uh, people are scared, and and I don't blame them. And so it's very difficult to have conversations with them about how some microbes that live on your skin are actually protecting you, how some microbes that live in your gut are actually you know sentinels and making sure that you don't get sick. And uh, to them, that's such a co- it's a foreign concept that I think we were just starting to get, you know, move the conversations around to get people to think about microbes in a different way. And then COVID hit and, as I said, put us back probably many years. So um, it's a it's a problem. And um, and I'm sure that this won't be the last pandemic, I have to say. <laughs> you know, that's a, there's another very sort of sobering thought is that uh, this could happen again in a few years time. Do we know if um, the microbiome of a child is, I don't know how to say this, but without saying it, it, is more fragile than the microbiome of an adult? So, for example, if we're taking, like you said, like we all know, rightful measures to, to, deal, to deal with COVID, but it's impacting their microbiome, like is it, yeah, is, it, is, it, um, is there a risk that it's just hard for them to uh, regain what they had initially because they're just so young and it, their microbiome's fragile? Or do we know anything about that? Yeah, you know, then that's a... That's another worrying thing. So we don't know, again, too much because uh, we're still very much in the infancy of understanding this. But what we do know is that the microbiome of a child, um, there's, a, there's a window for development. And that window for development seems to be between the ages of birth to three years. And after that time, that microbiome becomes very much... Um, uh, set. It should look. It looks more like an adult microbiome by that point, but it becomes very. Um, I don't want to say set because that 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 suggests that it doesn't change. It does change, but it becomes very much more um, uh, maintained, if you like. Mm. You know, you you end up with this sort of poo print idea that uh, um, so a poo print is something that that's with you for life, like a fingerprint. It's not quite like that, but it is kind of close. That you do get colonized by microbes that stay with you for life in terms of uh, the species content and things like that. So that process of colonization happens in that first three years. And and then after that time, for some reason, it becomes very difficult to change that microbiome, whether or Mm. not it's a good microbiome or a bad microbiome. And the reason for that, and and I say good and bad, you know, we don't know (laughs) how to define that, but, you know, not so good and not so bad. the, the, the reason we think that it might be very difficult to change is by the age of three years, the immune system has developed a bit more and it develops um, as um, influenced by the gut microbiome. And so the two things kind of work together. After the age of three years, it becomes very difficult to change. But if you have, if you interfere with the process of that developing microbiome by, I don't know, um, uh, using hand sanitizer or doing all of these other things. And, and some of those things may have only very minor effects and some may have more major effects. For example, antibiotic use. Uh, you may actually end up with um, with a microbiome that is d- disabled in some way and then that becomes sort of set uh, for life. And so, yeah. you know, that's kind of what I was alluding to in the beginning when I'm saying my microbiome is probably that way. <laughs> right. Yeah, and so um, and so the, the difficulty there is we don't know how set it is, and we don't know how much we can influence it and change it later in life. Um, the, I mean, I think the good news is that um, I think that that it can be changed, but I think it's not just a sort of like a one hit. Uh, here, take this probiotic, and everything mm-hmm. will be better. But I, I think that we need to understand uh, more about diet and things like that, and how we can uh, maintain a microbiome. Uh, that and we don't understand that um, right right now. Uh, but yes, I mean, it does concern me in COVID times that we have a generation of children now being brought up who are basically being kept. Um, for good reason, uh, away from the world. So they're not right. being colonized by the right kinds, whatever they are, the right kinds of microbes in a, in, in a sort of natural way. And, uh, and yeah, that is a concern. So we, um, oh, this, you know, I'm sure, I don't know how you feel about Kyle because I knew you have two young kids and my daughter's <laughs> just about turning four, but that's, that's scary, that's, Emma. Like that is yeah. very, very scary. And, um, you know, it's something that in our household we we think about. We just don't know. But to to hear that 
anyways, to hear everything that you just said is is definitely a concern. But yes, you got to balance it with the current risk of of COVID as well. And yeah, cause my yeah. son just turned three, and he uh, he spent has it been two years. He spent two years, you know, mm-hmm. like washing his hands eight times a day, and you mm-hmm. know, the occasional yeah. hand sanitizer and all that stuff. Yeah. So what, what I would also say is that there are some things that you might be able to do to kind of mitigate some of those issues. Um, and, and the big one, um, yeah, a colleague of mine at the University of Calgary actually has written a book and, and, and uh, in collaboration with uh, another colleague at uh, UBC has written a book called um, Let Them Eat Dirt, I think it's called, uh, or something like that. And, uh, and the idea is that, uh, that what we should encourage kids to do is to go play outside, mm-hmm. go get dirty. Right. And, uh, you know, roll in it, eat it, do what you need. because a lot of soil microbes are actually very similar to some of the microbes that we find in the um, uh, in, mm. in, in the gut. Now, of course, we have to be a bit careful about that because we shouldn't ever encourage kids to go play in the same place that the cat uses as a toilet or anything like mm. that. Right. Mm. Uh, so that there has to be a bit of, uh, you know, we can't just rub it in their faces. <laughs> right. But uh, uh, by the same token, um, one of the really interesting things that has come out of the research um, uh, more recently is the idea that indoor living is actually one of the things that uh, prevents um, microbiome development. And so mm. actually, if you can get kids to go outside for some part of every day and just have them interact with their environment, that's actually very, very beneficial for them. Um, and then, then another uh, study showed that if you have an animal, um, like a pet, uh, that goes outside, like a dog or a cat or something, that, that is also beneficial because they bring those microbes in uh, for better or worse. Mm-hmm. And then as well, having a sibling. Right, so if you have a sibling, siblings share germs. That's uh, you know it can be the bane of a parent's existence, but actually they're also <laughs> sharing not so uh, 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 dangerous germs as well. They're sharing uh, beneficial things. So there are things that we can do, um, I think, to to try to mitigate it. But right now, uh, as I said. We have to teach our kids that uh, that it's dangerous, n- you know, not to wash your hands if you've been in a public place. And um, uh, I think around the house, you don't need to worry quite so much, right? Mm-hmm. If it's your house, if you know it's just you guys in it. Um, but uh, but certainly, you know, you go out to a public park or something like that. You just don't know at this point, and it's a mm-hmm. it's frightening. It's frightening. But I think you know, to a certain extent, um, the the savior in all of this is going to be vaccination, mm-hmm. and uh, and. A, you know, if, if you've been vaccinated, you don't need to worry so much about it, and we don't need to worry uh, so much so much about uh, COVID. And then, you know, we can we can sort of get back to a normal lifestyle. It's just such a shame that there's such resistance to vaccination. I mean, that's a whole another story. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's a uh, it's a, that's a real shame because I think people are, are, are lacking mm-hmm. in understanding of what vaccination could actually do for us. Yeah, that's right. I know, I know you're, uh, Emma, you're an N of one, but uh, what does your diet look like? If you've said like your, <laughs> microbiome, my, your microbiome wasn't very good to start with, what are you doing? And I'm sure people are curious, like, okay, what does Emma do? Yeah, so I do a few things. So um, one of the studies I've done in the past is, uh, is, and other people have as well, is looking at artificial sweeteners, emulsifiers, colors, things like that. Uh, all of them, and I, you know, in my own lab, we've looked at artificial colors, uh, for example, azo dyes, and all of them seem to have a detrimental effect on the microbiome. Mm-hmm. And so um, when the study came out about artificial sweeteners now, oh, I think about over 10 years ago, um, that sort of showed how detrimental artificial sweeteners were. I used to be, I used to be a Diet Coke uh, addict, <laughs> and I just went, I stopped cold turkey. <laughs> And uh, in fact, now I no longer drink any sugary beverages at all. I just drink, uh, you know, uh, carbonated water or water. Mm-hmm. And um, and I have pulled every single artificial food substance out of my diet. Mm. Uh, not overnight. It's taken a while because uh, a lot of times you don't realize that these things are in foods. And so one of the things that I've started to do, especially in the last five to ten years is uh, is like I cook everything from scratch 
Um, and, um, and actually my youngest daughter who's at home, uh, she gets an allowance, um, and the allowance is so that she can help me out by cooking. And so she's actually learning all these skills as well. And we basically figure out a, um, a list of menu that we're going to do for the week. And then we buy all the ingredients and then we make it all from scratch. Um, the other thing that I do is I eat a lot more vegetables now than I ever have in my life. I am not a vegetarian. I would like to be vegetarian, but my husband wouldn't. Uh, there's just no way I'd have to be making like, different meals. And so, um, right. uh, you know, uh, so, but, but we have like joined, for example, a, uh, a farm share, uh, hmm. in Guelph. And so we pick up vegetables, fresh vegetables every week in the summer, every two weeks in the winter, and it's whatever's in season. And so we're always drowning in vegetables. <laughs> the moment it's squash season, we've just got so many, I'm going to make some hmm. butternut squash soup later this week. Um, but, um, uh, you know that so that's very important eating lots of vegetables um, and uh, fruits as well so um, I used to um, you know buy smoothies and fruit juices and things from the supermarket thinking that's a quick way of just getting my mm -hmm. five a day it's 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 very misguided uh, juicing is not what you need to be doing because you actually need the pulp of the mm. fruit uh, the fiber and you need part, the fiber yeah, yeah. Mm. so otherwise you're just taking in the sugary part which mm -hmm. is not the beneficial part so um, uh, one thing that I, I love um, is blueberries. And so I buy a punnet of blueberries every week and I basically eat them like can like candy, um, which is, yeah, they're, they're amazing. And yeah. it's such an incredible food. So high in fiber and polyphenols and all sorts of really good things. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I haven't touched a McDonald's. I, I, I avoid fast food like the plague. Mm -hmm. uh, that, w that wasn't something that, uh, that, that's again happened in the last 10 or so years. Before that, it was just like, you know, as a young parent, it was anything I could eat whenever I could, whenever I got the opportunity, because it was just, you know, life was too busy. So avoiding that kind of pressure to eat, eat quick. Uh, there's plenty of things you can cook from scratch quickly, which are not full of preservatives and, you know, other things. Um, and then another thing that I avoid, um, which is, is interesting in Canada, actually, as this is another difference between Canada and the U.S., is um, carrageenan. Mm. So carrageenan is a thickener that right. uh, actually I think it comes from seaweed or something like that. So it's thought to be natural quote unquote um it's a very big molecule and they use it to thicken things up it's not used in the uk as far as i can tell much uh and not certainly in, not, not in like plant plant-based milks over there in the uk uh, i don't know about plant-based milks because i don't okay. drink those so i've never okay. checked but uh, but here for example in canada your cream uh and your like sour cream and yep. things like that are all full of carrageenan mm. that's actually cheating because they're thickened that way and they're not just you know the natural mm -hmm. uh the fats that, that are thickening them it's just a, a way to kind of make them that i don't see that happening in in the uk mm. um and so um Carrageenan, and I, I'm, I worry about because um, this is a molecule that when it's break when it's broken down, uh, one of the molecules it makes is called polygenan, and polygenan is actually a chemical that we use in the lab to induce um, inflammation in, in rats and mice, mm. and so. Um, you know, the proponents of carrageenan will say, well, it's such a stable molecule, it won't break down in the gut. But what they don't understand is that your gut microbiome is chock full of microbes that have incredible biochemistries that can do things you have never dreamed of. And uh, probably breaking down po carrageenan into polygenan is one of them. Mm. Um, and so, um, so I avoid carrageenan from that point of view. And, and I worry that, you know, you find this thing in, uh, in health food stores as if it's because it's natural. And to me, it's mm -hmm. crazy to think that you can't just think that food is good for you because it's natural. You know, uh, if we all thought that, then, uh, you know, we might think that salmonella is good for you because it's natural mm -hmm. and actually mm -hmm. it's not at all. So I think we have to be a little bit careful. Like all natural uh, mushrooms that just kill people, right? Like there's all kinds That's of things right. in yes. nature that are all natural. That if you took exactly. one whiff of it, it would just kill you. That's right. I think natural is not necessarily no. healthy. Yeah. So um, I think, though, uh, that said, I think uh, certainly what's not healthy is artificial. Um, anything in food mm -hmm. so when you when you read a label on the side of a food can or whatever if you can't pronounce something that's in the ingredients then you probably not <laughs> best eat it uh, because it's probably you know full of uh, stuff also if the list of ingredients is longer than about six or seven things and it's probably not a good thing to mm. eat so um so i buy you know a lot of um 
uh, beans and things like that, lots of fiber rich food that I then kind of bulk up, um, uh, you know, with usual casseroles and things with so that, uh, we don't feel like all we're eating is beans, but they're in there. <laughs> and uh, that's a very good source of fiber. So I think, you know, fiber is, increasing fiber is a really good thing to try to do. It's actually also very difficult to do if you're not used to it. Hmm. And of course, the first thing that will happen is, is people will go, I'm going to change my diet. And, and we're funny in the Western world. We just decide that we're going to change our diet. And we do it overnight, right? And so we suddenly start to eat something really healthy. Let's say we suddenly start to eat loads of beans. Well, you can imagine what the consequences of that are. And so we then we think, oh, well, healthy eating is just uncomfortable eating. It makes me fart. It's, you know, mm. it's, it's just makes me bloated. And, and that's not true. If you give yourself time and your microbiome time to deal with it, then, uh, I mean, the reason it that adapts. you're getting, yeah, the reason that you're getting gaseous is because some microbes produce gases as a result of their, um, uh, their metabolic processes. So they're mm. eating the beans and producing gas. And there are other microbes that eat the gas, but they take a little bit more time to come up after, uh, you know, it's more than an overnight thing. So if you if you ate beans for a week, you would probably find that you'd have a very uncomfortable, if you ate nothing but beans, uh, you'd have a very uncomfortable few days, and then things would settle back down again. So, um, so I think it's all about, um, you know, trying to keep diversity in your diet, trying not to do, never fad eat, like fad diets kill me. They just like, I can't believe some of them are just, <laughs> and they're all like, you know, um, based on complete rubbish. Mm. Um, you know, I worry as well about things like the Atkins diet, mm. that sort of um, <clears throat> carbohydrate, low in carbohydrate. That also means low in, often low in fiber. Mm -hmm. and um and high in protein and and microbes in the gut if they if they eat fi if they eat fiber we call that something called sacrolytic fermentation they tend to make beneficial compounds from it uh, these mm. molecules these metabolites but when they eat protein because protein is has nitrogen in it there are a lot of compounds that they make that also have nitrogen in it which are not so nice not so beneficial mm. so um so protein should always be balanced out by carbohydrates and those carbohydrates should always or as much as possible be complex carbohydrates like fiber mm. so not a fan of the carnivore diet then maybe nope <laughs> well, if you look at the track record no, for I mean, all those fad diets, like wasn't there the war on fats in the 70s and 80s and everything? It was like no yeah. fat, like all fats are bad. And obviously that's not true. And there was the war on carbs. And, you know, it's it seems to be so extreme. None or all of. And, of course, no carbs is bad. All carbs is bad. And so it's just that, um, you know, that uh, track record for fad diets is not looking so hot. So maybe just ignore all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just think that there's the reasons that they're fad diets. You know, someone writes a book, and uh, and there's a whole bunch of PR around it, and people believe it, and people blog about it, and people and social media kind of gets yeah. in the way as well. Uh, and I think people don't see the science. They they always see well. People, uh, yeah, people will always see the easy things, you know, the, the PR, the celebrity, you know, telling them that this is a great diet before they actually do any, the average, you know, member of the general public isn't going to go out and read a, a paper, a scientific paper on this, and, and, and uh, which is a shame because I think uh, science has got it wrong from the point of view that it doesn't do very well at making science accessible to the general public. It's sort of a barrier that we have. And so in the void that is, that is then left, you have all the celebrities, you know, peddling their, their latest, yeah. you know, fads. And, uh, and people pick it up and believe it. And, uh, and that's a shame because I think that um, healthy eating doesn't have to be complicated. It, it really doesn't. And it doesn't have to be extreme. That, you know, it, it needs to be to, to – I think um, Rob Knight said it the best once. Um, he said to, eat a, to, you know, to maintain a diverse microbiome, you need to eat a diverse diet. So the minute that you try to restrict that – in any way, you're going to, you know, that that's going to have detrimental effects on your microbiome. Well, I think these diets are also, they're probably focused on very short-term objectives, right? And they may have yes. accomplished, like, you know, 
a diet to, to lose a bunch of body fat or whatever. And that, that you may have achieved that, but in terms of the long-term health of, of, of yourself, it's probably not, uh, not very beneficial. So for you, it's, it's really, uh, you know, simple, clean eating, removing these artificial, um, um, components to food, uh, is, is sort of, is sort of the focus. And, and, and I know we're, we're getting here to almost an hour and a half, but I just want to ask you really quickly about, so, you know, should people be a, not afraid, but concerned about like, let's say they had McDonald's a couple nights in a row or, 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 you know, how quickly does the microbiome adapt and, 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 and what does that resiliency look like? Like, do people have to be concerned about this? You know, I think if you, if you ate McDonald's like once in a, once in a while, you're probably not going to do too much damage if you've got a healthy microbiome to start with. Okay. Um, because you, as I, this is where the resilience comes in. You know, what's going to actually end up in your colon, which is where most of your beneficial microbes are after you've eaten McDonald's is very little. And so it's almost like a starvation for your gut microbes uh, mm. when you eat something as highly processed as a McDonald's burger and fries. Um, but if you just did that, you know, once in a, in a little while, then that's fine. If you did it more than twice or three times a week, I would be concerned. Mm. Um, so you, and unless you tempered it by sort of saying, okay, I'm going to eat this McDonald's, but I'm also going to eat this can of beans, you know, <laughs> and, uh, or something, uh, then, then maybe that's not quite so bad, but, but really, and honestly, I would be concerned more because we don't know what's in those foods. You know, they taste mm. delicious, but that's probably because they're full of all sorts of uh, artificial things that we really don't know. We've only really just started scratching at the surface of what a lot of these artificial food additives actually do to the microbiome. Many of them have been tested, obviously, for safety, uh, mm -hmm. but they've never been tested for their effects on the microbiome. So the safety is acute safety. You know, does it, is it going to kill you if you eat it? Mm -hmm. um, versus is it going to cause a slow decline of your microbiome? Those are two very different questions. And so, um, so you know, I chose, as I said, not to eat McDonald's. And it's quite funny. My husband, he still is tempted. And so he'll wait till I go away for a conference. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll come home and I'll find McDonald's wrappers in the bin and I'll, I'll have some questions to ask him. But, uh, but over COVID, of course, I haven't been traveling, so he hasn't had any McDonald's, and uh, he, he says he hasn't missed it. So, well, uh, you maybe, think you do a better job of hiding that. <laughs> you'd think, you'd think. Yeah, yeah. Either that, I'm just very good at <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, you know, that's... Uh... Yeah, he's, he's got to work on that a little bit, maybe. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I get it. Every now and then, a little burger. Ooh, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Emma, maybe to wrap up, you know, we always have our, our sort of uh, questions that we ask guests, but I, I do want to hear a little bit about uh, the company that uh, that you're leading here, New Biota, if you don't mind telling our listeners about that. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, back, uh, well, 10 years ago now, uh, a colleague of mine uh, in, in medicine uh, contacted me and she was doing, uh, at the time, she's an infectious disease doctor and she was working a lot with uh, patients who had a disease called C. difficile infection. So C. clostridioides difficile is a, is a microbe. It used to be called clostridium difficile. It causes a horrible kind of diarrhea. And it's a result of um, you only really get this infection if you take antibiotics, this type of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So the antibiotics basically clear out the microbiome and allow the uh, clostridioides difficile to grow. And when it grows into high numbers, it actually produces some toxins that start to uh, cause diarrhea. And it's actually it's a nasty disease. And by the way, I should just say, because I don't want anyone to sort of think that and that I think antibiotics are a bad thing because it must sound like that from what I've been talking about. But antibiotics save lives and I think that they're important to take if they are prescribed in the right way and these days they really are prescribed in the right way. Uh, but, but one of the risks that, um, that you get from, uh, from taking them is that you can end up with a C. difficile infection. And so um, one of the treatments for C. difficile infection is actually something really disgusting called a fecal transplant, which I'm mm. sure you've heard about. So mm -hmm. you basically take poop from a healthy individual and you give it to a sick individual, usually by way of an enema. And there are lots of problems with that. I mean, the thing is it works really well to treat C. difficile infection, but the risks involved are incredibly high, as you can imagine. And how do you go about making poop into medicine? I mean, that's just, there's, there's a lot of problems with that. So it's such a, uh, a difficult thing. Your donor needs to be screened for all sorts of diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if they are screened and then they subsequently eat a bad burger just before they get sick? They donate, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's 
all sorts of problems. We can also only screen for what we know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of unknown things in stool. So for lots of reasons, she wanted to improve on that. So she asked me, well, you know, Emma, can you just, like, because she knew that I could culture a lot of microbes that, uh, that other people have a lot of trouble with uh, from the gut. And uh, so she said, can you just make me a cocktail of microbes that we can put together to give to these C. diff patients? I said, yeah, why not? That sounds like a fun thing to do. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, so these are pure microbes that we then grew up and we gave as enema to, at the time, a couple of patients. And we called this concoction Repopulate, which, um, which I have to credit <laughs> a colleague at Western to, uh, for giving me that name. It was, it was great. Um, but it worked, and it worked really well. Uh, the, the, the issue was that Health Canada then said, you know, we were doing this as a um, trial, as a probiotic. And Ca Health Canada then, then said, quite rightly, well, actually, it's not really a probiotic in the um, uh, strictest definition of the term. And so really, this should be... Um, regulated as a biologic drug, which, of course, is a very different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. uh, so the kind of the, the whole project sort of died for a, a few months because we were like, we, we don't have the capital to do that sure. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, a couple of angel investors got in touch with us uh, based on the paper. And, um, you know, without going, you know, to, to make a long story short, we basically created a company with them to develop this sort of a idea and this approach as a drug product. So this is no, this isn't a probiotic that we're making. Uh, we actually, so New Biota is now grown. Uh, we started in 2013 and it's, uh, you know, we have um, a uh, production facility now in New York and we've also got the research hub here in Guelph. And uh, what we're doing is we're creating drugs which are, mixtures of up to 40 different bacterial species that we have picked that work together, talking about the synergy of microbes that work together to, to make different um, metabolites. So uh, what New Biota is trying to do is to create these as drug products. And, and the, the new part of this is that, that no one has really done this before, then there wasn't really a regulatory path to doing this. And so uh, we've kind of having to rewrite the book on that. Uh, so at the moment, um, Health Canada and the FDA have us create each component of that drug product, each of those species that is in our drug product as a separate uh, drug product. So that's 40 drug products in wow. one. So you can imagine it's quite a lot of work. Um, but uh, but I think it's it's for the best. I'm actually really pleased that we're taking the this approach because you know we're held to a much higher safety standard than mm. a probiotic would be, mm -hmm. and also um, you know we we have to test these when we when we run our clinical trials and we have several underway. Um, we have to be very very careful about the kinds of responses that we get. The safety profile has to be there, um, and uh, and I think that that's the responsible way to do it. Right. So I. I don't bulk at that. I think it's important. I think, um, and I do think that there's the, 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 the future of this kind of therapy is, is really there. Um, uh, we're not, we're not, we're not there yet, but I do think that there is a future in this. And so, uh, there's a lot of questions that we're trying to answer, but we're actually using the patient cohorts that we're doing our clinical trials in to answer some of those questions. And so hopefully We'll keep refining things over the years, and uh, and we'll be able to uh, make something so no one ever has to have a fecal transplant again. Uh, <laughs> we can do this. And the other great thing about it is that uh, that the capsules that we're making are orally delivered, so mm. there's nothing going up anyone's bum, <laughs> <Okay. which> is, <laughs> which is a great uh, thing for patients, I think. Um, so, would you do you do you suspect that you're um Folks are going to need a prescription to access these drugs then? Yes, because okay. these are live microbiological products which are defined as biologic drugs, they will have to be prescription only. And I think actually that's a responsible thing to do because what we're seeing in the fecal transplant world anyway is when, uh, when fecal transplants became trendy, um, people were just doing them without any medical supervision whatsoever. Really? Uh, just, yes, just to sort of um, you know, deal with whatever, whatever ailed them. Uh, and there were even some clinics that popped up in the UK that, that, was, that were doing these kinds of fecal transplants without any kind of uh, real medical oversight. Mm. And, uh, and the problem with that is that, uh, you know, 
it's my colleagues who in, in infectious disease who end up dealing with the sequelae of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them told me that once she had a patient come in who'd been given a fecal transplant and the donor had, had been someone who'd recently come back from traveling somewhere in Asia and basically ended up passing on some horrible parasite uh, to, the, uh, to the recipient, even though they weren't sick. You know, the, the donor wasn't sick, but the uh, recipient was, was already sick. So it was, uh, it was a real problem for her to fix. Um, and, um, you know, I can understand that desperate people do desperate things. Uh, but I really think that um, fecal transplants in, in, a, in an environment which is not uh, medically supervised is, is mm. a very, very dangerous thing to do. Sure, sure. Um, Kyle, should we get to our final questions here that we asked? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, Emma, hopefully you saw the, the, the last two questions. I, I've, I've been bad about surprising some of our guests, and then I feel terrible <laughs> about that. So hopefully you had a little bit of time to think about this. But um, dead or alive, who are five people that you would want to have dinner with? Yeah, I did see that question. I thought it was great. And I actually posed it to my lab as well because I said, this is such a fabulous question. This is a, uh, a really good uh, dinner conversation. Um, so I can think of definitely four. Uh, and the first one would be Stephen Fry who is okay. a uh, British comedian and also kind of philosopher. Um, he's still alive. Uh, but, and I would, I'd love to have a conversation with him. His sentiments on life are just very well matched with my own. Um, mm. He is a, a consummate atheist. Um, and I'm, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a total atheist, but, uh, but his views on life just really match mine. But he's just mm. so eloquent. Mm. And when he, when he speaks, he's, he's, he's amazing. And I just saw him pop up on my Apple Watch as a sort of uh, uh, one of the walk things that they've got going on now. So I'm going to have to go on a walk and listen to him. <laughs> cool. Um, another one would be uh, Sean Locke, another Brit uh, who recently passed away, actually, which is such a shame. A great British comedian. And just, you know, what, actually going back to what you're saying, well, what do I miss about Britain? Comedy is yeah. one thing. Uh, <laughs> I think the Canadians... Yeah, Canadian comedy is better than American comedy, I'll give you that, but it's not quite up there with the Brits yet. <laughs> and so um, Sean Locke is that's just like the best example I have of, of just that he's such a funny man and or he was such a funny man, you know, sadly missed. And um, and I think uh, it's some of the best stand up comedy I've ever seen. Um, uh, and it's just yeah, so he would be great. I'd love to have a conversation with him. Um, I think if if I could go back in time, I'd love to invite Le- uh, um, Leonardo da Vinci oh, yeah. because he was such a polymath. I would love to have him at a table and say, and give him an iPhone <laughs> and say, look what we can do now. What can you do with that? Because yeah. he was such a, uh, a forward thinking guy. And, uh, and yeah, I would just love to get into his brain because I think he's amazing. Da Vinci has um, the most amount of inventions, right? Yes, correct? yes. Yeah. So he yeah. was an artist and all, he was just a polymath yeah. And, yeah. and just yeah. uh, incredible. Uh, sort of, um, you know, I think his um, pictures of uh, helicopters, you know, before helicopters even existed, you know, were, were some of the most incredible yeah. things. And uh, was, um, yeah, just, I think, a very uh, unrecognized talent at the time. He was born too soon. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. so. Uh, I'd love to speak to him. Um, another person would be someone who is still alive, um, a scientist by the name of Polly Matzinger, who you may not mm. know. So Polly Matzinger is a an immunologist and actually has a very colourful past. Uh, she was a Playboy bunny, a carpenter, all sorts of really interesting. Um, uh, professions before she actually ended up in science and she didn't do, she didn't go the traditional route at all and she has an incredible way of thinking that I think is just so she's not mired in ac- in the academic kind of way and so she does things in a really un, un, you know unconventional un- unorthodox way including running her lab and her big theory her big sort of um, uh, contribution to science has been something called danger theory uh, which is the idea that um, that your body and your immune system, when the you know the the, the consensus or the the dogma is that uh, your immune system responds to non-self, yeah. So so it's non-self that is that is seen as dangerous. Yes. Well, Polly Matzinger says no no no. The thing that's seen as dangerous is anything that's around when the body is harmed in any way. <laughs> And so it's a sort of a bit of a shift from the sort of dogma. And she has got a lot of evidence to suggest that this is, in fact, um, true. 
what I, I'd love to have a conversation with her because she has stuck by her convictions, and uh, she, even though she has been, you know, the, the immunology field is full of a lot of, you know, elderly white men who have very high opinions of themselves, <laughs> and I think she had to fight that quite hard to get to to, to get heard, and um, and and I think that uh, that her her theories have kind of um, have endured. And, uh, and I love the fact that she kind of bucked the trend and she kind of, um, one of the things that she did that always makes me laugh and I'd love to do it, you know, the, the, science is a, it, it still is to a certain extent an old boys club uh, and uh, certainly in publication and things like that. So a number of years ago, she published some papers um, uh, alongside authors who turned out to be her dogs. <laughs> and uh, when, the, when the editor of the journal found out that this was the case, he banned her from publishing the journal. And she just used that as a bit more PR and sort of thing because she was basically just showing everyone, you know, the, exposing the sort of uh, the problems with publication. <laughs> so, so she would be another one. And then I think the final person is someone who probably many people would invite, and that would be Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. I just think that uh, he was just such a uh, he seemed like such a normal guy, <laughs> honestly. With a, you know, everyone says he's got such a giant brain, but I think it was more the way he thought about things. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and I think, um, especially in his earlier years, I think he was much more of a humble person. And I, I'd like the younger Einstein to, to come mm. to dinner. That would be great. Mm. Yeah. Great list. Kyle, what do you think that says about Emma for, for five? <laughs> oh, man, that put me on the spot here. Well, I, I feel like um, <laughs> lighthearted and humble. So, like, there's a lot of humility in that list, sounds like. And a lot of, uh, obviously, comedians. First two are comedians. Yeah. Uh, so you like to laugh, I would assume. Um, and yeah, just the, the humility note about Einstein, but also intelligent people and also people that maybe sort of buck the trend a little bit. So maybe you're a bit of a rebel. So you're a funny, humble rebel. That's what it is. Funny, humble rebel. Yeah. Funny, humble rebel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always like to think that, uh, I always tell my students that, uh, scientific dogma is a really bad thing. Mm. Because if you rest on your laurels like that, no one is challenging the science and mm. we should always be challenging the science. And uh, we should always, we can't ever assume that, uh, you know, we prove a hypothesis that we're right mm. because in another light we might be wrong, right? We, we can only do as, as well as we can in, in, in the light of what we know yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. That, that lack of peer review is uh, sort of what's the problem right now with uh, mainstream media and, and uh, knowing yeah. where to trust what information. So, yeah, um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. You also, yeah, and, and this whole thing about, you, um, I had one professor tell me you want to prove your hypothesis wrong, right? Like you always wanted to kind of take that yes. approach. Um, yes. Yeah, and I think that you write Kyle and society were often not, not thinking that no way right. at all. So um, last question, Emma, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, besides the circle of life, what do you know for sure? <laughs> I, I I thought long and hard about this, um, and I couldn't really come up. I think what I, what I know is that I, that I don't know, huh. I don't know, and that's the thing. Humility. I just uh, I think that yeah, I, I think that that I, I I know that we don't know everything in science. I know that uh, that we're making as a society decisions based on totally irrational things right now mm. uh and uh and that if we just use science a bit more then we might be we might advance better as a society i think um that uh and i think that yeah and what else do i do i know for sure i know that for sure we're not going to get out of this covid uh, pandemic anytime soon unless people start to take vaccination seriously mm. but um i think um yeah i i think that's about it, really. I, I don't. I, I think that's the answer. I don't Two know. great points. <laughs> that's that's something I hope you've relayed to your students because I remember coming off my when I finished my bachelor's, feeling all high and mighty about the degree I just finished, and then going and doing a research thesis and learning that I actually don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. And I was, you know, you're just put into your place by these incredible professors that you work with who also feel like they don't know anything. So. Um, I think that's a really, really good yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I think I feel like an imposter most of the time. Uh, so I, I and if and you're I, feeling that way, like that's so <laughs> I looked at your <laughs> at your profile for the University of Guelph, and it has a list at the bottom that says publications since 2016. There's dozens. There are dozens. So I, I don't know. I would say that um, you probably could maybe get rid of the imposter feeling. 
uh, just a touch. Well, I think, you know, I think the sad thing is that it's kind of inbred, especially in, in female scientists. And I try mm. really, really hard for my female uh, mentees to, to try to stop them feeling mm. that way. But at the same time, I wish I knew how to, how to do that. So I think it's, um, it's just an unfortunate uh, kind of side effect of the times that, that we live in. Mm. But, uh, but maybe it's also because, like I say, I will never pretend to know everything. And I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I always will be. And, um, and I think that's, I, I'd like to keep my mind open. The minute that my mind closes and I think that I've succeeded in something, that's when I need to retire. <laughs> Because then I've, then I've come to the end of my career. That was a great piece of yeah. advice, and I hope that people take that away. <laughs> Emma, this is uh, this has been an incredible treat, and uh, what an amazing way, Kyle Hay, to start our, our Saturday morning. To be honest, awesome. and uh, I've learned so much, and I hope everyone uh, enjoyed this this episode and this talk. And Emma, it really was a pleasure to have you on our show. Um, I, we'll, we'll make sure that we put Emma's information on our show notes and so you get an understanding of, of um, you know, her research and new biota and, and where to contact her and all that. But um, Emma, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we would love to have you back anytime uh, if, you're, if you're willing and able. Uh, it would be another uh, incredible pleasure of ours. So thank you so much for your yes, time. Yes, thank you. I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. I did, actually. I always love to talk about science. So, yes, anytime. And maybe, yeah, in a couple of years' time, I'll have more stuff to tell you about uh, the research that we're doing right now. Perfect. For sure. All right. Take care, Emma. Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye.